Well, howdy, Tri-State. We are finishing up our current series this morning. We've been doing a series called Framework. Um, how does the Bible structure my life? And looking at the various ways uh, in which Scripture kind of provides this skeletal framework for, for everything that I say and do here on this earth. And so we're concluding this morning by looking at the subject of the purpose of Scripture. What is the Bible basically about? And it's a, it's a really good question to ask, particularly when, if you've been following Jesus for a while, because it's really easy to get sidetracked and start to think of the Bible as primarily a book that's really about um, finding answers for living um, and finding, finding sort of like a, a road map for life. And, and it's true, there are, there are maps in there in the back. Um, but, but largely, the, the Bible has a very, very narrow purpose, and we're going to kind of explore some of that this morning. So if, if you have your Bibles, um, we're just going to jump right in. Um, Luke 24, starting in verse, I've already forgotten, actually, I'm sorry, uh, verse 13. We'll start in verse 13. So Luke 24, verse 13, um, we'll jump right in. Um, my introduction is like 20 minutes today, um, and I have like three points then to kind of wrap us up. That's just kind of a preview where we're, where we're heading um, and, and looking at sort of the, the landscape um, of the New Testament world and kind of um, how they saw the Bible and, and how we tend to see the Bible today. Uh, here, here's where I'm starting. We'll start with the definition, okay, that the purpose of Scripture is to reveal God's character and will and, and the means by which I love, honor, and obey Him. So, so Scripture's whole purpose is to reveal God and then reveal how I relate to God. So, so everything about, about who we are and how we, we serve God um, is contained here between the, the pages of Genesis through Revelation. So here in Luke 24, we actually see a story, uh, one of my favorite stories actually of Scripture, of um, two, two travelers on the road to Emmaus. Um, this is after Jesus has risen from the dead, but before any of the disciples really had fully comprehended this reality just yet. This is Luke 24, verse 13, it says this. It says, That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened, meaning the crucifixion of Jesus. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from, from recognizing him. And he said to them, What's this conversation you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened in these last days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucify him. But we had hoped, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see." Let's pause there just very briefly. It's interesting, really, because these guys have now heard the gospel. I mean, they've heard the gospel about Jesus rising from the dead, and, and to them it was bad news. I mean, the, the whole irony is that, that Jesus suffered and died for their sins. He came back from the grave conquering death, but they're bummed out. And it, and it says right here in the text that what they had hoped for what they hoped is that he would be the one, Jesus, Jesus would be the one to redeem Israel. See, for, for so long, Israel had lived in this whole period of exile where, where maybe they had their land, maybe they had um, everything that, that God had kind of, kind of promised, but they were still living under this corrupt dictatorship of Rome and they, they never really felt spiritually at home um, in their land anymore. 
And, and what they had hoped for was that when Jesus arrived, he would put an end to the exile, he would announce a new exodus and establish freedom, not, not merely spiritually, but politically, and, and save the entire nation from their, their, their oppression by the Roman government. That's what they had hoped for. And because they hoped for those things, when Jesus had failed to deliver, they were super bummed. I mean, they, they just they couldn't comprehend the, the radical, deeper nature of the gospel. And, and the reason that so many of us in our world today are just, just so just, just alienated by the gospel and by Christianity is because we're, we're hoping for the wrong things. See, most of us live our lives somewhere along the road to Emmaus. We, we walk through life sad that our expectations go unfulfilled. Not long ago, there was an article in the New York Times talking about the way that we have become just random floating people in, in the world. We, we even use the word random to describe so many things. Like if you're a, a young person or a teenager, you might say like, that's so random. Or, or there is even a, a TV show, I think, now called That's So Random. And, it, it, and what the article was trying to argue was that, was that you know, terrorist threats, rising divorce rates, all of these things have had a profound psychological impact on Western society. And because of that impact, we, we now live in a world that we don't feel at home in anymore. And so we look to things, we look to, to whether it's TV programs, we look to career, we look to social media, we look to relationships, we look to sex, we look to all these different things to try and satisfy our need to find home. Ever been to Ikea? I mean, the entire store is dedicated to this exact thing. I mean, it seems superficial, but there really is something to be said about a whole society dedicated to, to finding versatile solutions for modern living. We, we don't feel at home anymore, so we're looking for home anywhere we can be found. And, and, and some of you, even in the places you look for home, can't find it there either. Because whether it's in your actual house, your home, whether it's in your career, things aren't going the way you expected. Like your career is eating you alive. Your, your family life is just, just chaos right now. And so what, what you often will do is you'll open the pages of Scripture and, and look for a gospel that speaks to your immediate needs. And, and what Jesus says is, is you're, you're not looking deep enough. See, you're still looking for a Jesus that comes to, to offer comfort for your emotional concerns, a, a Jesus who comes to offer you sound financial advice, a, a Jesus who will give you relationship advice and criticism. You're looking for a Jesus to solve the, the problems that you believe that are on your heart right now. And what the gospel says is that those problems have not penetrated deep enough to understand the true root issue. Here's what Jesus says in the next verse. Verse 25, he says this, he said, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe, all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. See, if we look deeper, we recognize that the problems that we face go much deeper than politics. They go much deeper than morality. They go much deeper than our relationships. They go much deeper than our careers. They go so deep. They go all the way back to the beginning to, to where our, our ancestors first rebelled in the garden and we got kicked out. And ever since then, we've been trying to get back to that paradise, that home again, th through all these different ways that just don't work. And Jesus says, listen, the, the reason that, that Christ had to suffer and die was to pay the price not, not merely of your earthly concerns, but to suffer and die to heal you from the deeper wounds that you've inflicted upon yourselves ever since the day you were kicked out of paradise. And so if, if our greater problems are, are morality, then we look to Jesus as a moral teacher. If our greater problems are political, we need a, a political Messiah. But if our greater problems are sin, then we need a Savior who goes to the cross. 
And so what Jesus says to them is he opens the scriptures and he says, listen, the, the stories that you have been telling for years point to me. And, and if you're here and you're, you're not really unsure about the whole Jesus thing, at least know this. There is no other religion on earth where the founder of that religion says the teaching and himself are the same thing. Like, like Muhammad, Buddha, all those guys, they had teachings, but those teachings were always about something else, like a, a way of life or, or how to connect with God. Jesus is the only one who says that the teachings that are in the Bible are, are standing literally right in front of you, flesh and blood. And, I mean, the strange thing about the whole story that we're looking at right now is that the, the, the guys on the road have yet to really even like, put the pieces together and realize that this is actually Jesus standing right there. But Jesus is saying, listen, let's open the scriptures together. Let's actually look at the way that the, all of the Bible from beginning to end is really about me. See, see if scripture says that, that the, the purpose is to reveal God's character and will, and the purpose is to also reveal the means by which I love, honor, and obey him, then, then all of those, that, that entire purpose is contained and realized and embodied in the per person of Jesus. Like, like we have only to look to Jesus to understand how it is that we relate to God, how it is that everything in the Bible ultimately points to him. So, so the reason that so many of us struggle in our devotional lives is because we're spending so much time looking for answers to our immediate concerns rather than looking to the answer, Jesus, and finding Jesus in every story. There's a really great writer um, who wrote a really amazing book called The Blue Parakeet, and uh, a Christian writer, and uh, a guy named Scott McKnight. And, and what McKnight says is that the entire Bible is a collection of what he calls wiki stories. Like Wikipedia is made up of all different individual articles that make one large internet encyclopedia. The, the Bible is contained with a bunch of different wiki stories that if we, if we put the stories together of David, Moses, etc., if we take, put all those stories together and take a step back, what we see is one large story about Jesus. And if you were living in the Old Testament times, if you were living in the days before Jesus, then when you look at those stories, you're seeing stories that have yet to reach completion until the day that Jesus comes. And, and so what, what our task is, as people who are, are devoted to Scripture, is to learn to be really good at reading the Old Testament twice. Like we read it once, understanding the way that the original readers would read it, and we read it again, understanding the way that, that we read it now in light of who Jesus was, is, and is to come. Like when Paul was converted, like Paul, like we all know Paul, the Apostle Paul, the New Testament, uh, I mean, he was one of the, the, the most devout Jews who ever lived, um, circumcised on the eighth day, trained under, under Gamaliel. I mean, he was the, the greatest most religious guy you'd ever meet, also the most vile terrorist of the ancient world, um, murdering Christians because they represented a threat to the Jewish faith. But when Paul was converted, when, when God got a hold of Paul and revealed the, the risen Savior to Paul, Paul spent about three years of his life going back and rereading the entire Old Testament and coming to a better understanding then uh, of how those words are now embodied in the living word, Jesus. So what can we say then about the purpose of Scripture in light of the fact that everything in the Bible is about, about Jesus? We, we can say three things, okay? For, first of all, that, that Jesus embodies God's story. Okay, Jesus embodies God's story. Um, John chapter 1, verse, verse 18, it says that no one has ever seen God, um, but the only one, Jesus at the Father's side, has made him known. And if you're a nerd and you're reading the Greek, um, the, the phrase has made him known comes from one singular Greek word, exegesita, where we get the English word exegesis, meaning the study of scriptures. And, and basically that word meant that all these Old Testament scholars would just pour over all the stories to extract some meaning from them. And Jesus says, listen, or actually, John, I'm sorry, John says, listen, all those stories ultimately are embodied in the person of Jesus. Um, Hebrews chapter 1. Um, let me turn there. I didn't write these down, so now I'm having to flip. Hebrews 
Hebrews chapter 1 says this. He says, Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also he created the world. In other words, that the, the very word of God that came to all the different prophets, like God's actual voice takes on human flesh in the person of Jesus. Like, like everything in Scripture is now embodied in Jesus. So that, that means two things depending on your background, okay? Like if, if you're here and you're not really sure about Jesus, if you're here and you're not really sure if you can really trust every word on every page of Scripture, um, it, it means that you're, you're challenged then by Jesus because you can deconstruct a text. Like you can, you can look behind the text to see the culture's intentions. You can, you can criticize them for having some hidden agenda. Like you can, you can dismiss the words on the page, but you'll always remain confronted by the word made flesh. Like, if Jesus had never come, then, then all of our scholarly ways of explaining away the nature of the Old Testament, or even the New Testament for that matter, all, all of those things m- might matter. But if, if Jesus actually embodies that story, th- then even if I'm reluctant to believe the, the text, I, 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 have to, I have to do something with Jesus. Secondly, if you're here and you've, you've come from more of a church background, um, as we said earlier, I mean, listen, we, we, we often go to scriptures as if we, we some kind of, um, you, know the, you know the Merck manuals, the, the Merck medical manual? If you have a set, or like, or, or WebMD, we'll use WebMD, we're, we're, te- we're you know, technologically savvy in today's, today's world. But you put in your symptoms, right? And, and out pops some kind of diagnosis. And we often go to the Bible expecting some kind of diagnosis for like our immediate problems. Like, you ever done this, where where you have some immediate like problem in, in your life that you don't really know what to do? So, so I was actually taught this at one time in, in like growing up in like youth group, that that you know the Holy Spirit works in mysterious ways. Therefore, you just open your Bible at random, put your finger on a verse, and that's that's God speaking to you right now. Genesis three something and they realized they were naked like it it doesn't always work that way so so the problem that you and I face is that listen if we treat this bible as if it's just a a, a useful manual rather than a, a just deep biography then then we'll always spend our time looking for the next answer the next immediate fix for our problems, rather than learning to just sit at the feet of Jesus and actually just love him. Secondly, Jesus fulfills God's law. Jesus fulfills God's law. Um, Does God expect total obedience to his law in today's day and age? Um, I'm talking about the, the, the years after the cross, after the resurrection. Does God expect total and committed obedience to his law? And, and the answer the gospel would give us is a surprising and resounding yes like, God's standards of righteousness haven't changed at all. I mean, he expects us to have this, this, this dynamic, um, amazing, like, holy perfection. I mean, God is ferociously and deeply holy. Like, he, he's not going to write off those who, who, who fall short of that. But the question then becomes, well, okay, how do we obey the law perfectly? Because we can't. In fact, it even says elsewhere in Scripture that the law was given to reveal just how bad we are. But like, like the law is kind of like the MRI machine at the hospital, okay? Like Matt, Matt Chandler, pastor in, in Texas, he said that when he, he, got, he got brain cancer a number of years ago, um, and, and he said that when he went through that, he began to understand more, more deeply not just the love of God, but the perfection of God. Because lying in an MRI machine, the best the MRI machine could do for him was tell him how, 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 how bad it was. Like the MRI machine alone could, could not possibly offer him the cure that he desperately was praying for. And if we look at the law, the law can tell us just how bad we are and just how high God's standards are. And now it, 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 it fails to actually bring us to a place where we are able to fully obey it. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 4, it says this, 
Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Matthew 5, 17 says that Jesus did not come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. What's that mean? Imagine it's tax season, and, and you have some elaborate new tax form you've never seen before, um, the penalty of which is, is steep. We'll, we'll even say that it's death. Why not? And, and, and if you fill out this form incorrectly, like, that's it. Like, there, there's no possible hope. There's no possible future for you. And so you've got this elaborate form that's got just so many pages, you can't even count them. So, so you, you, find, you find your Savior, okay? Um, you, you go to a guy like Larry Goldman, who, who knows tax codes and things like that, and, and Larry will fill out your form for you and hand it back to you. And it means that if Larry does it perfectly, the IRS will treat you as if you have that perfect spotless record. And so what Jesus does is he does the same thing with God's law. He, he fulfills the law perfectly, and, and then when he dies on the cross, two things happen. He, he absorbs my guilt, but he gives me his righteousness, so that even though I have no righteousness of my own, he has fulfilled the law, and now I live as if I have a perfect, spotless record of always loving my neighbor, always loving God, and always obeying every single commandment that there is. So the question that we have to ask and answer, especially in, in today's very crazy world, is, okay, no, well, why don't then, why don't Christians uphold every single law that's actually written in the Old Testament? Because, I mean, there's laws in there about wearing, like, different kinds of fabric, what kinds of food you should eat, all these different dietary and ceremonial types of things. Is it inconsistent, then, for Christians to harp on some particular moral issues and not others? And we'll hear that argument very frequently in our world today from our non-Christian friends, uh, even from, from news agencies and news articles. So we have to ask and answer the question then, okay, why is it then that we, we adhere to some things and not others? And, and the, the shortest answer we can give is that when Jesus fulfilled the law, he fulfilled my requirement to obey every single thing in, in every, every single detail. Like if Jesus fulfilled that for me, I no longer have to worry about obeying that myself. So, so ironically, it would actually be inconsistent for a Christian to love Jesus, but also try to obey the law perfectly. Because if we love Jesus and love him deeply, he has, he has paid the price for us and granted us his righteousness in return. Now I already have that record. I don't need to go back to the Old Testament laws anymore. In fact, if I do, it says in Galatians, I put myself back under the curse of the law all over again. Third, Jesus assures God's people. Jesus assures God's people. It says in John 16, 33, this is Jesus in the upper room with his disciples the night before he, he dies. And he, he says, listen, he says that, that take heart, I have overcome the world. I have overcome the world. If, if Jesus has defeated death, I mean, he, he conquers sin and death on the cross. There, what else is there? I mean, what else is there out there that can possibly be that big of a deal for us? And if we think about the way that we often pray, and we think about the way we often relate and respond to God, like, like it's almost silly. I mean, it's almost comedic. I mean, we, we basically go to God and say, listen, God, I trust you. Uh, I know you got the whole death thing covered, um, but, but work's killing me right now. Like, I know you got the whole death, you got, you've, you've conquered the grave, um, you came back from the dead after three days, um, you paid my penalty for sin, um, but I'm lonely. There is nothing, and I mean nothing on this earth that could possibly, just could possibly be a bigger deal than death. I mean, if, if that enemy has been just, just destroyed, and there is nothing left for us to really worry about here in this life. So, so when we read Scripture, then, we, we are reading the fact that, that God has already conquered all of those things and all of those earthly problems. And that's why when we read this next story, I mean, well, not this morning, but our next sermon series will be on David, 
we'll, we'll look at the various ways, and we'll, we'll kind of try to do David twice, like I just said. We'll, we'll, we'll read David through the lens of the original audience, but we'll also look at the ways that, that David kind of fulfilled, or, or po- I'm sorry, not fulfilled, but pointed to the Savior who would one day fulfill all of his roles. Like just preview, sneak preview. Like David and Goliath, like, like we often preach that story in such a way that, okay, you get your, get your five smooth stones and you're going to conquer your, the giants in your life. If, if Jesus is the true and better David, that, that it means that he, he already fought the battle and achieved victory over the greatest Goliath of all, which is death. And if he did that for me, not by me, but if that happened for me, not by me, that it, that it means that I now can achieve that same victory in my life. I can now live in the hope that one day death will one day be swallowed up in, in total victory when Jesus comes back to restore all things. So it means that we read every single story in the Old Testament through that lens. We read every single story of the entire Scripture through the lens of, of what Christ has done for us. And when we do, we begin to realize more and more that this whole book, the whole purpose of the book, is not merely to solve my immediate problems, but to actually just draw me closer to Jesus. Let's go back to Luke 24. Luke 24, verse something. I'm flipping. I'm also nearsighted. Luke 24, verse 28 again. Uh, They drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it's towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord's risen indeed, and has appeared to Simon, Peter. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he, had known, had, how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. What's happening here? I, I've heard this, this preached before in, in a way that they said, well, Maybe when Jesus broke the bread, his sleeves rolled up and they could see the nail marks. I I think that's possible. But I think there's such strong symbolism here in the breaking of bread that I think it's hard not to see some, some level of mystical, spiritual revelation happening right there before their eyes. Like if, if it says that they were kept from recognizing him earlier, it means that in the breaking of bread, they actually had be, became aware of who this guy was. This was Jesus right there in their midst. See, what, what does the bread and cup symbolize in Christian communion? It symbolizes a, a body broken for us and, and blood spilled for us. It's, it's the audiovisual display of, of what Christ has done. I, I mean, the reason that we, we gather to take communion f- frequently as a body um, is, is because this is what God kind of gave us to, to remember and memorialize what he has done for us and, and, and to remember that the time that we will celebrate communion together one day re- united in, in joy in heaven with the marriage supper of the Lamb. To, to, to know that everything in the Bible now comes down to this moment of, of, of looking at what God has promised us and, and the gift that he's given us in his, in his Son. And, and, I, and I, love, I, I love the verse that says, we're not our hearts burning within us while he opened the scriptures with us. I, I mean, there's that really raw sense uh, that, that the scriptures, when we read them through the lens of Jesus, will just set our hearts ablaze with love and devotion to him in a way that, that nothing else can. I mean, read the Bible like a manual and your heart will be cold and sterile and always found wanting. Read the Bible like a love letter, like a biography of the Savior, and, and your heart will just burn within you. It, th- this past year, um, uh, Reuters, rep- uh, Reuters News Source reported that, like, out of all the films that had been produced and were up for nominations of the Academy Awards, like, most Americans had only seen, like, two-thirds of them. 
I'm sorry, like I think two thirds of Americans hadn't seen any of them, I think was the statistic. Um, instead, they, they were spending their money going to see movies like Frozen, um, Iron Man 3, um, in other words, like, like fairy tales and like comic book superhero movies were, were what people really wanted to see. Not, not the darker, more brooding dramas that for awards in the theater. Why is that? J.R.R. Tolkien, the, the author of the Lord of the Rings series, says that, that, that fairy tales work and they work well and they stay with us because they all contain something he calls the eucatastrophe. Eucatastrophe literally means good catastrophe and he says that there's a turning point in every story. He, and he says it's the, it's the joy that produces tears. The joy that produces tears. And he says that, that Christianity is the ultimate eucatastrophe. Because at the resurrection of Jesus, we actually see joy revealed that produces emotion, produces tears. And when we look at Jesus, when we look at our scriptures, when we look at the Bible, we're, we're looking at the, the story of, of all stories, the greatest story ever told, that when we read it and we read deeply and we, we love deeply, we find ourselves just captured in that and we're no longer looking in, at ways to fit Jesus into my life, but looking at ways in which I, my life fits into God's greater story. Let's pray. Father God, thanks for this morning. Thanks for the chance to just gather together to discuss what the, what the actual purpose of your, of your word is. Lord, help us to repent um, to turn for, uh, from treating your Bible as if it was merely an instruction manual or a self-help book, but rather treat your Bible as if it just contained um, just a magnificent portrait of your Son, our Savior. Lord, we, we pray that we'd be men and women who um, just spend our lives just pouring over every word, um, not, not merely looking for some nuggets of guidance and wisdom um, although they are there, but rather just looking to deepen our relationship and our love for you and your son. It's in his name we pray all these things and by the power of your spirit. Amen.